The moment we've been waiting for is here. In the SEC versus Ripple case, the SEC has filed its objections to Judge Netburn's ruling compelling the SEC again to turn over the Hinman speech documents. They have dropped a massive 20-page filing rehashing the same things that they've been arguing from the beginning about DPP, attorney-client privilege, and so on. It is what I would consider a mess. I don't think that Judge Torres will let this go through, but we're still going to go through it in detail and talk through what's in the document. Now, because it is 20 pages, this will be a two-part video. This first part, I'll go through the first half. It's set up such that it breaks almost exactly in the middle. And then in part two, which I will record as soon as I'm able to get this video uploaded, in that one, we'll go through the rest of it in detail, as always. And in that section, we'll kind of break down some of the main arguments that they're making and try and see if there's any logic to the nonsense that they've been spewing thus far. So again, two parts. Make sure you stay tuned for that second one when it drops shortly after this one first post. But if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. As always, courtesy of James K. Filan, we have the document. You can see my response to the dumpster fire that is this uh, submission by the SEC. Apologies if there's any kind of uh, word jumbling or anything. I've skimmed it. I'm going to go through it here together with you so that we can get it out as soon as possible. And the other thing too is there's just not enough time because of the length of this document for me to go through if there's a minor word error and re-record or edit or anything like that. So we're just going to plow through it and we'll take it from there. So here's the document. Again, 20 pages if we jump all the way to the bottom. Just this pure filing. Uh, page 21 is all the signatures. Layden Stewart, Pascal Guerrier, Mark Sylvester. Jorge Tenrero, who we haven't seen his name on much lately uh, since his promotion by Gensler, Daphne Waxman, and so on. So, again, 20 pages. The overall conclusion we'll just read. For all the reasons they list here, the SEC respectfully requests the court sustain the objections to the January 13th, April 11th, and July 12th orders, set the orders aside, and find the SEC has properly withheld the speech drafts. So the SEC wanting Judge Torres to overrule Judge Netburn here and allow them to keep these under lock and seal. Now here is the table of contents. There's a ton here. So we'll look through the first nine pages everything leading up to the arguments. So the second video will go through the arguments in more detail. Here in this first video, we're going to hit their preliminary statement, the background, and that legal standard of uh, review. And then again, part two will be all of the arguments that they're trying to make. So let's get right into it. These are the table of authorities. These are the cases that they're referring to, and they have them listed by page. Some very familiar ones in here. You can see Kick is one that we're well versed in, as well as some of these other little uh, case references that we've uh, noted before. So again, just uh, take note of what those are, and you'll also see here the rules and regulations they'll cite in the document. So we'll again start here, nine pages in this video. When we get to video two, I'm not going to do a bunch of introduction like I am here. We'll just jump right into it. So plaintiff, SEC, respectfully objects to Judge Netburn's January 13th, April 11th, and July 12th orders compelling the SEC to disclose 64 internal drafts of a speech by former SEC Division of Corporation Finance Director Bill Hinman and the emails circulating speech drafts. Pretty shocking there, just seeing the dates associated with this. Three times this year, in 2022, she's ordered them to produce documents, and they haven't. And going back to last year, remember we had April and May orders saying that they needed to produce documents, and they haven't. So it's been a year and a half almost that they've been keeping these under wraps. Here's the preliminary statement. This court has recognized that the SEC's 
non-public communications have no bearing on this case as internal communications that no market participant, including defendants, has seen, the speech drafts are not relevant to any of the claims or defenses at issue in the case. Yet, the orders compel the SEC to disclose them. Even if they were relevant, the speech drafts contain confidential deliberations and legal advice protected by the deliberative process privilege, or DPP, and the attorney-client privilege. Pausing for a second, note how the SEC just won't let it go. The DPP and attorney-client privilege claims have been shot down, both of them, yet they are still grasping onto them as the lifeline that will keep them from having to produce these documents. It's shocking that they just won't comply with the court, but as we've noted before, they're exhausting every legal avenue they have before them to not produce these before they're found in contempt of court. Now, continuing here, they say these privileges serve important public interests. The DPP promotes the quality of agency decisions by preserving and encouraging candid discussions between officials and the attorney-client privilege, which applies with special force in the government context, ensures that government officials have access to informed legal advice. If allowed to stand, the orders will chill internal internal deliberations, not only at the SEC, but at other agencies as well. Director Hinman's speech, which he gave while he was the head of CorpFin, provided guidance to market participants about how staff in the SEC division would analyze whether offers and sales of digital assets constitute securities under Supreme Court precedent. This sentence encapsulates the hypocrisy that Judge Netburn has called out. They're saying that he gave guidance to market participants about the SEC, even though he stated under oath, and they have stated previously that it was his personal opinion. That is hypocrisy, as called out by Judge Netburn at its absolute worst. Continuing, the speech was not binding SEC policy, that is, a pronouncement of the commission itself, the commissioners appointed by the president with the Senate's advice and consent. Rather, Hinman, while the head of an SEC division, developed the speech in consultation with other SEC offices and divisions as part of the SEC's larger discussions about the application of the securities laws to digital assets. Indeed, Director Hinman consulted over many weeks with dozens of SEC attorneys, several of whom reviewed and revised multiple versions of the speech. During the speech, Director Hinman stated that it contained his personal views, a disclaimer required by SEC regulation to ensure that market participants did not attribute his views to the commission, and similar to disclaimers that officials from other federal agencies provide when giving speeches. The order's central holding is that because of that disclaimer and statements based on the disclaimer, the speech and communications relating to its preparation were not agency deliberations and consequently the speech drafts are not privileged. This finding is contrary to law and based on clearly erroneous characterizations of the factual record. This is funny that the SEC is saying Judge Netburn had erroneous characterizations of the factual record when Ripple just accused them of mischaracterizing information just earlier today. Shameful SEC. Continuing, the orders hold, in essence, that if agency staff deliberations lead to a public statement that is not a formal action by the agency itself, the DPP and attorney-client privilege do not apply to those deliberations even though the same deliberations would have been protected had they led to an internal memo substantively identical to the speech. This result is inconsistent with controlling authority, recognizing the value of continually examining agency policy regardless of what, if any, action an agency ultimately takes. The orders also do not account for how the SEC and other agencies function and how they communicate and interact with the public. The orders assume that if a speech does not convey official agency policy because a majority of commissioners has not voted to approve its content, it is therefore personal and cannot be agency business, but senior officials at the SEC and other agencies routinely give speeches that provide meaningful information 
to the public about staff approaches to legal and policy issues, even if those approaches do not formally bind the agency itself. If permitted to stand, the orders would chill the ability of government employees to deliberate about important policy issues and obtain candid legal advice from agency lawyers. The orders should be set aside as clearly erroneous and contrary to the law, and the SEC should be permitted to withhold the speech drafts because they are both irrelevant and privileged. So there is the overarching argument of the SEC. Does that seem like nonsense to you? Let me know in the comments below. And if you appreciate getting this info in full and as early as possible, please drop a like on the video and don't forget to subscribe. Here's the background. Director Hinman's speech. Director Hinman's June 14th, 2018 public speech was the culmination of weeks of non-public internal deliberations involving SEC attorneys across the agency. In May 2018, David Fredrickson, then Corpfin's chief counsel, began drafting the speech. Over the next month, he, two other attorneys, Miss Valerie, we've referred to in the past, a digital asset specialist at the SEC, and Michael Seaman, Director Hinman's counsel, and Director Hinman worked on the speech, exchanging at least 23 drafts. On June 4th of 2018, Hinman circulated a draft of the speech to officials outside Corp Finn, including counsel for then chairman of the SEC, that's Chair Jay Clayton, officials from three other SEC divisions or offices, the SEC's Office of the General Counsel, Division of Investment Management, and Division of Trading and Markets provided substantive comments. Director Hinman, Fredrickson and Seaman revised this speech in response. On June 11th, uh, Director Hinman circulated a revised draft to many of the same officials who had received the earlier draft, and several of those officials provided a second set of substantive comments. Director Hinman and Corp Finn attorneys further revised the speech to address these comments and exchange drafts until Hinman gave the speech on June the 14th. The speech communicates Corp Finn's approach to evaluating whether digital asset offerings may be considered securities offerings. Hinman began the speech by noting that the conference provided a great opportunity to address a topic that is the subject of considerable debate in the press and in the crypto community, whether a digital asset offered as a security can over time become something other than a security. Hinman provided some of the factors to consider in assessing whether a digital asset is offered as an investment contract and is thus a security and stated that Corpfin staff were happy to help promoters and their counsel work through these issues. He also provided a list of features relevant to determining when a digital asset functions as a security and specified that this list is meant to start the dialogue with Corpfin staff. In his deposition, Hinman confirmed the speech was intended to share more generally the framework that Corp Finn was using in thinking about these assets. Hinman prepared the speech as part of his functions as director of Corp Finn so that people would be able to see how the division under my leadership was looking at these issues. Speech was intended to inform the marketplace of how Corp Finn and I felt about these topics, and Corp Finn applied the speech's framework when considering whether digital asset transactions involve securities. All quotes from that deposition. Hinman began the speech by giving a disclaimer required to be included in any speech or publication by any SEC employee. Hinman noted my remarks are mine alone, not necessarily those of the commission, commissioners, or the staff. The text of the speech on the SEC's website contains a similar disclaimer. As Hinman explained in his declaration, the speech was intended to express my own personal views. During my preparation of the speech, I discussed my thoughts with other commission employees as part of the speech or the commission's ongoing deliberations about whether offers and sales of Ether constituted securities transactions. To the best of my knowledge, the commission had not taken at that time and still has not taken any position or expressed a view as to whether offers and sales of Ether constituted offers and sales of securities. Publicity following the speech recognized that while the speech was not final SEC policy, Hinman was addressing how Corp Finn staff would advise the SEC. For example, one of defendants' counsel stated, while Hinman's views are not binding on the commission, his remarks strongly suggest the commission's willingness to consider 
whether certain digital assets that may be initially offered as securities over time can later lose their status as securities. Now, just pausing a second here, this is why Judge Netburn called out their hypocrisy. They, in this section, have said it was personal views. They quoted where he said it's personal views. But then they've said that he was reflecting the division at the SEC court fins take on what was happening in the digital asset space. You can't have it both ways. Judge Netburn recognizes this, and it certainly seems like Judge Torres is going to as well. But we'll see. Continuing here, the next section is the relevant procedural history. This is what's happened in the case thus far. So the defendant's motion to compel SEC communications. Back in March, on the 15th, defendants moved to compel the SEC to produce external and internal SEC communications about XRP, Bitcoin, and Ether. The SEC opposed the motion on the grounds that the SEC's internal communications are irrelevant and are, in any event, privileged on April 6, 2021. Now, again, this is 2021, over a year ago. Judge, uh, Judge Netburn granted defendants' motion to compel production of external SEC communications, but stated that she was not including SEC to SEC internal communications in that ruling and denied the request for discovery that is internal and specifically internal, for instance, email communications between what I will call the SEC staff to SEC staff. Judge Netburn clarified in a May 6, 2021 order that the SEC must produce or log documents that are final and formal but need not produce or log informal intra-agency communications such as email. So again, all of that in 2021. I may have said uh, the wrong year at one point in there, but that's all 2021. Again, for time's sake, I'm not going to be able to go back and rehash. Just know now everything in that paragraph is 2021 spring. Moving forward, Director Hinman's deposition on June 24th, 2021. The SEC moved to quash a deposition subpoena served on Hinman. In its motion papers and oral argument on the motion, the SEC made clear its position that the speech was not official SEC policy, but was part of SEC deliberations. And then noting here in that the SEC speech uh, its official in did not the SEC did not give the speech its official imprimatur, but also speech drafts were deliberations comprising part of the process by which governmental decisions and policies are formulated. And Judge Netburn compelled the Hinman deposition. Before the deposition, the SEC provided defendants with privilege logs that included the speech drafts, but made clear. We do not believe these or other drafts are intra-agency intra memoranda or formal position papers that must be produced or logged pursuant to the April 6 or May 6, again, 2021, orders. The SEC also reserved its right to argue that the speech drafts need not be produced or logged pursuant to the court's orders. Then, the defendant's motion, the orders, and the court's relevant decision. On August 10th of 2021, Defendants filed a motion to address the SEC's privilege assertions. In response, as part of its argument that the DPP should not be pierced, the SEC argued that its internal communications were irrelevant to any claim or defense in this case. After a hearing, the SEC provided 17 documents defendants had identified, one of which was a speech draft to Judge Netburn for in-camera review. Now, we're finally to 2022. On January 13th, 2022, Judge Netburn ruled that of the 17 documents submitted for in-camera review, the DPP did not protect three, including the speech draft. This is the January order. The January order reasoned that the DPP does not protect the personal views of agency employees unless they bear on the formulation or exercise of policy-oriented judgment. The January order found it settled that the speech reflected Hinman's personal opinion and not the SEC's position, relying on the standard disclaimer that the speech was intended to express his own personal views, and the fact that the SEC has never taken any position or expressed a view as to whether offers and sales of Ether constituted sa offers and sales of securities. Without pointing to other facts, the January order concluded the speech was merely peripheral to actual policy formation and not an essential link in the SEC's deliberative process with respect to Ether. 
At the same time, the January order held the SEC need not produce drafts of other public documents made by SEC officials, including Hinman, on the issue of digital asset regulation because draft talking points and questions and answers for SEC officials' use in communicating with the public are protected by the DPP because they concern SEC staff opinions about what to present to the public as agency policy. In the course of finding that defendants could not pierce the privilege, Judge Netburn addressed the relevance of the documents to which she had found the privilege applied. She first found that defendants had not established that the SEC's internal deliberations implicate the fair notice defense, which is an objective defense. They're just throwing that in there, though, just to have it in the paper. Next, they, she, or they say next, she next concluded that SEC internal deliberations could potentially be relevant to demonstrating ambiguity or uncertainty as to XRP status, which could bear on the scienter of Garlinghouse and Larson for purposes of the claims of aiding and abetting. On February 17th of 2022, the SEC moved for partial reconsideration and clarification of the January order on the ground that the court based its decision on a single document relating to the speech and did not consider the more than 60 other emails attaching drafts of the speech that were before the court on defendant's motion. Then on March 11th, this court denied the individual defendant's motion to dismiss the aiding and abetting claims. The court held the SEC need not demonstrate that the individual defendants were aware that Ripple's scheme was illegal. Rather, to prove Siander for aiding and abetting, the SEC must show that the individual defendants knew or recklessly regarded the facts that constitute a Section 5 violation. The same day, this court denied the SEC's motion to strike Ripple's fair notice defense, but agreed with Judge uh, but agreed with the ju- oh, sorry agreed with Judge Netburn that it was an objective defense that looked to the language of the statute in question and the SEC's outward facing conduct. On March the 14th of 2022, the SEC filed a supplemental letter in support of its motion for partial reconsideration of the DPP ruling explaining in light of the March 11th order, it's clear that the SEC's internal documents reflecting its staff's thinking about XRP, Bitcoin, Ether, or any other digital asset have no relevance to the individual defendant's scienter. Non-public SEC documents cannot shed any light on whether individual defendants knew or consciously disregarded the facts that constitute Ripple's alleged violation. Then, on April 11th, 2022, Judge Netburn denied the SEC's motion for partial reconsideration, relying on the January order's conclusion that the speech conveyed Hinman's personal views. The April order found that the emails and drafts here were service, in service of remarks that were explicitly not agency policy and held that because the speech was not an agency communication, the deliberations as to its content are not protected by the privilege. In response to the SEC's argument that this court's ruling on the applicable scienter standard rendered the speech drafts irrelevant, Magistrate Judge Netburn declined to take such a narrow view of relevance in the context of discovery. The April order also invited the SEC to renew other privilege assertions for any document where the DPPs found not to apply. On April 29th, the SEC renewed its assertion that the attorney-client privilege protects most speech drafts. On July 12th, uh, Judge Netburn held that the attorney-client privilege did not protect the speech drafts, concluding their predominant purpose was not to provide legal advice to aid the SEC in conducting the public's business. So that's that most recent order. So here's their standard of review and where we'll finish here. When a magistrate judge issues an order on a non-dispositive pretrial matter, a district court must modify or set aside any part of the order that is clearly erroneous or contrary to law. An order is clearly erroneous only when the reviewing court on the entire evidence is left with the definite and firm conviction that a mistake has been committed. An order is contrary to law when it fails to apply or misapplies relevant statutes, case law, 
or rules of procedure. And that's what the SEC will argue when we get to part two, that Judge Netburn misapplied relevant statutes here, and they want then Judge Torres to throw it out. We'll dive into that in the second part here. Make sure you hit that like button on your way out. Subscribe so you don't miss when that one is released later on this evening. Thank you so much for spending some time here. Don't forget the second part. Have a great rest of your evening. I'll see you in the next one.